Um, so I thought I might introduce the subject in a way before I introduce the two speakers. Um, it's been sort of set up like a kind of epic film beyond collecting what is patronage. Um, Ezra Pound, a long time ago, um, described patronage as a creative act. He said, if an artist um, builds an artwork, then you need a patron to build that artwork into the world. And I think what we're talking about really is how artwork and voices get platforms in which they could be seen or heard that otherwise wouldn't be through acts of giving and support, whether it's financial, moral, or in any other way. And so I'm gonna stop theorizing about it now because we have two actual patrons here. Um, next to me is Pamela Joyner, who's based in San Francisco and um, is a collector, but also supports residencies, publications, uh, research, and is a member of Tate's International Council. And then next to her is um, Fusin Ezejibachi, who's based in Istanbul, and also supports artists through foundations and supporting artworks, and she has her own foundation that she'll talk about in a moment. But I thought it would be nice to begin with if um, we started by introducing your collections as a way of introducing yourselves and your interests and how these private passions become part of a public civil discourse. Pamela, would you like to? So, am I, is my mic on? Yeah. So, um, our collection is primarily painting, primarily abstraction, beginning in 1945 till yesterday. In fact, I see an artist to my left who, you know, almost yesterday I, uh, but a wonderful uh, new series from uh, Sam Levy Jones. Um, and we are, in fact, mission driven. Um, the genesis of the collection it focuses on African American artists who have been overlooked by history. And so our mission is no less ambitious than to try to reframe that aspect of art history that has been omitted. Um, so all of our activity, um, the boards I sit on, our the publication we have about our collection, uh, the book we've written in support of the careers of the artists who we love, um, the residency that we uh, run in Sonoma is uh, in service of that mission. Uh, so that's in a, it in a nutshell. Um, my interest in art goes back to my uh, student years when I was a student at Academy of Fine Arts uh, when I was studying architecture there. And uh, the very first works were the gifts that my f uh, friends gave me. The, those were the very first works that were hanging on my walls. Uh, then the... Uh, the last year when I was doing my master's, um, I heard that a teacher's family was selling some artworks that he passed away and they were selling some artworks uh, that he had acquired during his residency years in Paris. The two works were in the offer. Uh, one was a small Arman uh, piece and the other one was an Andy Warhol's another small version of it, flower series. Of course, being a student and earning little uh, with my part-time job, I was able to buy that Armand piece, uh, which is still in our collection and uh, which is still uh, in our, on our walls. Later, we started going to Basel um, together with my husband, and the first years, it was more Turkish, modern, and historic figures. We still have them, uh, but after a certain time, we uh, decided that we want to have art, we, have, we want to live with art witnessing today. S uh, and uh, because we are living in Turkey, it should be from our country as well as international artists. So it is in that sense, it's very diverse. You can find artists from all over the world. Uh, and uh, the medium is also very diverse. We have many videos, many photographs, paintings, sculptures, works on paper. So it, it doesn't have that kind of a direction. But uh, the main criteria is uh, they should have a common visual language. And they should coexist together and create a story together. That's uh, our vision on that, and it should be a reflection of our 
uh, story, uh, and it should be a very personal uh, collection. That's why it is not a collection of artists, but it's a collection of the works with a visual language, I should say. And I'm wondering if there was a, a particular moment when you realized that your passion for art had gone beyond what you could put in the bedroom, in the living room, in other areas of the house, and suddenly you're setting up a foundation like Saha and acting in a public realm in a different way maybe than it was when it's just a private passion. So in our case, um, we had an aha moment um, about a decade ago when we moved to London. And um, I mean, this is um, particularly poignant for me. I see all of um, my pals from uh, Tate sitting in the front row and also to my right here. Uh, so I, we sort of landed in London and um, started working with Tate. And I got a really um, life-changing call from Nick Sirota, who um, had, you know, I mean, everyone knows Nick's you know, gargantuan reputation, um, but what struck me about Tate was the global focus of the endeavor. And Nick introduced himself to me over lunch one day and said, we really have an interest and a need in building our exposure to African-American art. We understand this is what you do, will you help us? Well, that had the effect of having us up our game materially. When Nick Sirota asked for help, you've got to bring your A game. Um, and I was reading, I think, an art net or somewhere today that, um, you know, Nick um, shared with uh, the current prime minister that museums should be a place not only for contemplation and reflection, and I'm going to paraphrase him a little bit here, but places for uh, debate and the exchange of new ideas and essentially activism. So we now consider ourselves to be activists. And so uh, this whole array of activity that we describe naturally led to us outgrowing the four walls in any of our several houses. Um, so, you know, we're having, like you, to have work that's one in dialogue with uh, the other. Um, but this notion of revealing stories of artists of the African diaspora that either have been overlooked or need to be recontextualized or properly contextualized uh, is not just a local American subject. What we discovered over the years is that it's a global subject. Um, and so we'll never have enough walls to house the ambition we have for this collection. Um, yeah, talking about aha moments, I also had aha moments. It, uh, the most strong one was, until that moment, I was interested in nice objects, nice objects that I could own and hang or see and live together with. Uh, it was, I think, the year 1993 when we visited Venice Biennial. Uh, the moment we get into the German pavilion and the, with the legendary artist Hans Hake's installation titled Germania, with just nothing, nothing. It was a bare room uh, with shattered floor. And, but I still have goosebumps uh, and because of the feelings it gave to me. It was a re reference to the problematic history of the uh, German pavilion, the, uh, the biennial, and also the fascistic dictators manipulating. It, it had so many layers, and it was just a shattered floor. At that moment, I came to a conclusion that art is not about objects. Art is about ideas. That was my first aha moment. But of course, then, uh, personal, my personal uh, story from being a collector to a being a patron or an enabler uh, took many, many years and many accumulation of many different experiences, whether, I, I don't know whether we should give, get into them now or later yeah, on. Yeah, we can get into them now. Now, okay. Let's dive straight in. <laughs> okay, okay then. Um, so I was, because I studied in Academy of Fine Arts, I was very close to many artists who are now they are my age and they are the prominent artists of today. We were very close, but, uh, and I was witnessing their frustration because in our country, we have wonderful institutions, uh, 
They are the backbone of the cultural li uh, life there, but on the other hand, their funding is limited to their own programming. And there, there are no government funds for supporting contemporary art, and the institutions have only running their programming, so there, there was no uh, support for production of arts, especially their inclusion to the international networks and international exhibitions. So witnessing my friend's frustration and talking to artists many times, and it, uh, the year 2010 was a very specific, another aha moment. Uh, it was the year an artist duo was, sent, uh, was ex uh, invited by Tate. Tate has a big history in uh, both of us because Yes, at the Tate, I learned a lot about uh, how to support your own ecosystem. And Tate invited them for the 10th uh, the anniversary exhibition, Tate Moderns. And, uh, but they, just before three weeks, they understood that they were not going to be able to do it because uh, they, the promised funds were, they, they, they are not going to get because of bureaucratic reasons. To cut, it, cut the story short, in the end, three of friends, we helped them and sent them, and then we decided that we should start something on, on, under an organization. We cannot do these individually because it wouldn't give a full, full body of support, and we should start. That's how it started. And for you, were there particular times when it started after the tape, when it started to expand? I was wondering there's a difference between having the collection and working in a local ecosystem however big that is, and an international one. Does that change how you approach art? Uh, I mean, at, at the core, it doesn't change how I approach art because we're trying to tell a global story. Um, but um, what is really additive to how we go about telling that story is uh, to meet people all around the world and to um, really commune with a group of art world inhabitants who are learners. And so one learns uh, about how to embellish one's own collection and one's own philanthropy when you hear stories about Turkey, um, which seem to be not directly related, but this approach can be directly related to what we do. Um, and so, I mean, they're, 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 this becomes an iterative process. So in our case, um, we have decided that we are most keenly, it's not as though we never support exhibitions and programming, but for us, what's missing for our artists most keenly at this moment in time is presence on the museum wall. So what we really like to support is the pictures on the wall, the acquisitions. Um, and that has gotten to be you know, a global enterprise for us. Um, so you know, we're really thrilled to try to help Tate where we can in that endeavor. Um, Tate has um, a uh, blockbuster show that's um, opened in London earlier this year and is touring around for a while called Soul of a Nation. Um, we own paintings in that show. We've donated a painting from that show. Um, and it really just helps expand the story, yeah. so, so it's not a local story, it's a global yeah. phenomenon. Is that the kind of activism you were talking about to kind of change an institution in a way? So I mean, like the Tate in particular has, you know, that's where I learned art history, and certainly when I learned it, it was a much more limited art history than it is today in terms of the collection and what gets shown. Well, 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 yes, and that, I mean, it's been a marvelous surprise that institutions are willing partners, I mean, even proactive partners. Another story I can tell is I see a colleague, I'm new to the uh, Getty Trust Board and I see one of my Getty colleagues, um, Andrew somewhere, I don't see him right, right away. Oh, there he is, Andrew, hi. So, so um, when I went on the Getty Board earlier this year, the Getty team said to me, you know, we've got really the world's best uh, state-of-the-art repository of art history, um, art, of art archive, artist archives, and we've got you know, the preeminent research institution focused on art and art history in the world. So what can we do around artists of color that leverages that activity? So now we're going about setting in place a program to do that that Andrew is spearheading, and you know, we're collaborating with experts from all over the world, including London, um, uh, to do that. And so, 
Um, this is just a moment where I think the natural curiosity resident in the ecosystem um, is blossoming in a broader way than has been true of the art histories that we have learned in textbooks. Um, and the textbooks are being rewritten. I mean, I wonder how this, this idea of broadening um, the history of art and the experience of art relates to a world in which many of those experiences in the social and civil realm are becoming narrower. I mean, I can say certainly from the UK perspective with Brexit and um, we all know what's going on here as well. Is it something you feel like you're sort of fighting against the tide? No, I, I think we're reflecting the tide. Um, I mean, I don't see uh, what you're going through in the UK as being materially different in substance yeah. than what we're experiencing here or than what you're describing you experience in Turkey. I mean, the particulars are different, uh, but the, the guts of it are not. And so we all have a lot to learn and to share uh, with each other, I think. For sure. Uh, but talking about placing artworks on the museum walls, we didn't come there yet. Ours is seeing artists and art from our geography included in the international cultural networks. Uh, because, as you know, we were talking about the Venice Biennial and the funding of the uh, pavilions. Uh, when an in international exhibition is set up, we know that all the curators need to raise funds. And they feel it at, uh, more ease if they know that from a certain uh, country, they can easily find funds. Turkey's case for a long time was very difficult. They knew that if they invite anyone for the international exhibitions, it was not that possible, that easy to find funds. So that, that's where we stepped in. Now they all know that there is an organization who is there willing to provide funds without interfering the selection, without interfering the works, uh, the content of the works, but just there, or for publications, just there to provide the support of the inclusion. Uh, in, that made a big difference in our case. Uh, being on the museum's walls is great, but it will come after that inclusion, first of all. I, mean, I think that brings up one of the interesting things maybe that could distinguish collecting and patronage, in that the way you're describing patronage is partly about a suppression of your own ego and your own in interests. Do you have moments when you've supported something and then afterwards you think, oh my God, what have you done? Um, where you're kind of not really into the outcome? Is it ever difficult like that? Or are you quite uh, relaxed? Uh, so about that you, the supported project. You yeah, do. when it's realized, let's say. In my case, I'm not there for the selection. Mm -hmm. None of us, organization ref refrains from the selection because we are not art professionals. Yeah. We just want to make the organizations know that they are free to choose whom they choose. So it is, in that sense, it's very different. Uh, most of the organizations do the other way. They pick up the artists and they support those specific artists. In our case, it's just inclusion of the artists from this geography. So no, it doesn't make me feel bad because I know that correct people are choosing the correct, uh, according to the content of the exhibition, of course. So for me, it is the, the dialogue they create and uh, the inclusion uh, in the network is more important. So I can't say we've ever had a bad experience. We also um, have to defer to the expertise of the professionals and the organizations because we're not art professionals. Um, so what usually happens in our case is museums come to us with a particular acquisition interest that we in turn will support. Um, and, I mean, if anything, I get the opposite, ex I have the opposite experience where I'm always pleasantly surprised about how that work is contextualized, about what subsequent acquisitions are made to dialogue with the thing that we might have made an initial gift of. Um, and um, in, in the case of several organizations, I mean, people have put together whole programmatic initiatives and, you know, 
large exhibition uh, strategies to support the kind of inclusion that we've been championing over the, 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 a number of years. I mean, for both of you, I guess with what you're supporting, it's quite a big responsibility in a way. It feels like the way you describe it. Um, is that something you feel is a pressure sometimes? Because in some ways you're talking about supporting a public art program in the whole country and rewriting an entire art history backwards as well as in the present. Well, I mean, again, in our case, um, I mean, I do feel a sense of, a keen sense of responsibility, but this is not a singular activity on, on my part at all. I'm very aware that it really does take a village. So I, it is probably more accurate to describe what we are interested in doing as um, an effort to catalyze the ecosystem in having an interest in our area of interest. Uh, so when you know collectors you know, walk into a fair like this and simply see some of our artists of color in the broad context of the full arc of the full historical canon, I count that as a victory. Um, and so it takes a lot of people doing a lot of different initiatives to get to the finish line that we're interested in. In my case, it's a big responsibility because it's not uh, a few people's support. It's a collective support. It's the whole members, more than 100 people's support. So we are raising funds with their equal donations each year. And we are spending that money that we collect. So it's a huge responsibility to our members and to, to the artists we uh, support. So it's, that's why we refrain from the position of who is career we are pushing forward. The, because easily it could be relying on our personal tastes or personal, uh, and 100 people is not that easy to manage in that sense. But they know that it is very transparently, uh, all the, uh, we are because monitored each year, uh, everything is uh, put on the website. And they all know that uh, the funds are being spent on the real cause. That, that, that's my first responsibility. On the other hand, of course, you need to do it in the most efficient way. You, don't, you should do it you know, in price efficiency, let's yeah. say, in a very uh, simple uh, way to say. So uh, I, I feel a lot of responsibility in that area. And Pamela, you brought up the idea of ecosystems just now. And I think maybe it's important to talk a little bit that it's not just supporting an individual artwork or an individual artist, but there's also research, education, all these other aspects um, of dialogue and discourse around the work that you're supporting as well. Well, absolutely. So we, when we wrote a book last year, um, it wasn't intended to be a scholarly endeavor. But we intended, and we were fortunate enough to have some 20-odd scholars contribute to the book. Um, so the notion was that we would, again, catalyze a group of you know, top professionals to go on to write more scholarly journals. Uh, and in fact, there is work that has come out of that effort um, that is focused in that way. Um, similarly, I would point to the initiative um, that is going on at, at the Getty. Um, you know, we have a you know, large advisory group of top professionals in the field globally that, are, that will be focused on providing a resource uh, whereby PhD candidates, for instance, can do primary research. They're really, and the Schomburg Museum in New York historically has played some of that role, but that that resource is not robust enough for today's scholars. So um, it's, it's really our view that in order to support a career or a set of careers, the career has to have you know, the curatorial support and the scholarly support has to have, for lack of a better way for an MBA to describe this phenomenon, you have to have the distribution channel, right, which we're sort of sitting in the middle of that. You have to have great gallery support and you have to have great collector support. Um, and so that part of the ecosystem that's dedicated to research, I think it is 
is uh, an area where we can fill in some missing pieces where there really has been a gap. Um, and I'm just thrilled that, you know, the Getty is enthusiastic and is deploying the resource and the personnel uh, and the expertise to do that. Um, so that's a little bit my strategy. I'm, you know, I, I try to think hard about, I mean, to this sense of responsibility, you know, try to th I try to think hard about what's missing and what would further the mission. And then um, I try to deploy my resource and then I try to encourage others to focus their resource on filling those gaps. Ours also started for filling the gap because there was an acute need, and, uh, but it also has different layers of doing it. It's not only production support, it's also you know, uh, publication support, it's also research support, or we invite curators to come to uh, Turkey we have a residency for curators for them to stay and make their research. So it also has different layers of doing it. But inspiration is a very good word. That, that's also very important for us. We could have easily raised funds through 10 people instead of 100 people. But this is where, you know, having the support of 100 people instead of 10 people, is much bigger than the funds raised. It is a much, much bigger support uh, morally, and uh, so motivating others is a very important aspect of it. I mean, as you're describing, both of you are describing this, and it's a lot of what you do is inherently social, it seems, working with other people, talking to other people. Um, do you find that you're old-fashioned private life is now diminished and more of more of your time is taken up with these activities? Yes, but it's really a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you get to, when you have, I mean, we have a passion about art, we have a passion about our artists, and we have a hyper passion about our mission. Um, and so, I, it's hard for me to draw the line between sort of my art life and my private life. Um, you know, I mean, especially with the residency. Um, you know, when Sam and his family come, they're our next door neighbors, and his daughters make me wonderful little artworks in the summer, and I get to poke around in the studio if he'll let me in uh, to see what new things he's working on. And in turn, we hope we provide a space that, you know, gives you the mind space and the, you know, the time to contemplate sort of new avenues. Um, and I just, there just isn't a line for me between it anymore. At the end of the world, you know, art world is not that big. So it doesn't, it doesn't reach big, big audiences that would make us nervous about or, you know, uncomfortable about. Uh, but it is the most interesting people are here, the, the, the most exciting people. And that, as you say, it is so enjoyable to be together with them. Yes, I spend a lot of time in traveling and interacting with those people, but uh, I cannot complain. It's nothing better. I mean, I think we've, we've talked a lot about how you support artists and artworks and institutions, but I think, I know Pamela, you've mentioned this before, that a lot of what you're doing is providing access both ways. So not just for the art into the world, but for the world and the audiences into the artwork. And I wonder how much that plays a factor in what you do. No, I, th I mean, I think that, that yin and yang, that back and forth is key. Um, and that actually is the thing that breaks down the barriers. And there have, in the area in which we collect, been these historical barriers. And really the message that we're trying to spread is that race in particular is a really bad lens through which to view art. Um, and when you have that back and forth, people just don't think about it anymore. They just think about what it is they see and what it is they're experiencing uh, with the artwork on, you know, back and forth. And to me, that's what's supposed to happen. For me, the, we don't have an education program, so it, but, but it is, again, in a different way, both ways. So one mission is provide support and pro pro an open space for our artists to go from Turkey 
and also bring people to Turkey to look at them and to interact with them. So it works both ways in that sense. But education, uh, it is another mission. Um, we're about to make it work both ways here as well. So you might want to think of some questions if you want to join in. But I mean, one thing that people often have a concern about when they talk about patronage, not just in the arts, but in other venues too, is that patronage can become a kind of propaganda and become one person's message um, that's being pushed through these institutions into a general audience. Is that something you ever think about or worry about? Um, I don't really worry about it. I do think about it. Um, but, but fortunately, the institutions with which I'm involved and, you know, even more importantly, I mean, the institutions, um, I mean, that sounds really sort of, um, you know, lofty and impersonal. I think of each institution with which I'm involved as a series of individuals. And I can tell you that um, James Rondo and Mark Godfrey and Sheena Wagstaff at these various places, I mean, they are opinionated people. And so <laughs> there's, I can't foist my opinion and my taste on anyone, and I don't want to. I just want to serve up what I think is best in class for people's consideration and hope that they endorse my point of view. And, and you know, one will like one artist and, or, you know, one method of making and another will have another point of view, and that's kind of what makes the world go round, and I find that really stimulating, and I learn a lot from that, too. Our method is different, yes. so uh, I don't think it <laughs> creates any interference. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you've clearly worked a system that would avoid that. Yeah, the, the system is based on that idea, yeah. in fact. Uh, so, because it's, again, it's a collective uh, system, so from day one, we decided that we, we will be away from that position, and we are away from that position. So, there is no concern yeah. on that aspect. So, um, collectivizing the discussion now. Um, are there questions from the audience? I think there'll be someone coming around with a microphone if you want to raise your hands. There's a lady here in the middle. Uh, Pamela, I'm not, I'm not familiar with the Sonoma residency. Can you speak a little bit more about that, please? Um, so, uh, about, Four or five years ago, uh, I bought a um, really undistinguished house next to a home I live in in Sonoma that was owned by Tina Turner's roadie. <laughs> and, I, and it sits on six acres of ground, 1,500 feet above the floor of the Sonoma Valley, and you can see San Francisco from uh, the really old windows that still need to be replaced. And I probably should have torn the house down, um, but... Um, Actually, that year I was entertaining a Tate group, and one artist said to me um, from that group, paint the house white and make it a residency. I said, that's a really good idea. So that's what I did. And <laughs> so there's no art hanging in the house. What you get is a 20-year-old a Mercedes-Benz SUV and a closet full of dry goods. We make a deal about the dates you can be there. We actually did turn the garage into a proper studio. There are no strings attached, um, except that you have to either be in our collection or be a candidate to be in our collection or be a scholar that is interested in doing research around the topics that we address in our collection. Um, you call me up and say, I want to come. We figure out the dates, and you have at it. Uh, and you can be bothered with the next door neighbors. That would be us or not. Um, and, um, you know, we've got an okay wine cellar over there uh, that didn't burn down, if um, that's your pleasure. And that's the deal. The only two things you have to do um, is um, let me um, give you a, a luncheon or a dinner where I invite a group like this uh, and sign the book. And one day I'll give that book, uh, and Andrew, it is archival, um, um, to a museum. And that's the deal. So is the wine cellar normally still there once the artist leaves? <laughs> uh, some artists uh, diminish it substantially. They do. Are there more questions? There's another one in the middle. Uh, Pamela, you said um, something that was provocative for me. 
um, that race is a terrible uh, thing to look at art through, a terrible lens for looking at art, uh, to paraphrase you. And um, I wonder how, and that, that reminded me of something, I, I, a statement I saw at a recent Turkish biennial, which was uh, a statement that identity is a prison that we choose to belong in. Um, and so I'm wondering how those, for me, provocative ideas, uh, how you square your work from within your identities or within the context of a racialized America um, well, with your mission. Well, so, I mean, we focus on artists of African descent, most of whom happen to identify as black. However, we own artists like William Kentridge and Xander Blum and Mikhail Sabatsky, all South African, uh, who uh, do not identify uh, as black, but I could make an argument that they are more African than I am. And so, I mean, actually that sort of clarifies the point about race, um, which is um, that there have been historically arbitrary barriers set up for artists of color. And so we're endeavoring to remove the arbitrary. That does not mean that one's identity doesn't reside in the work. Um, but if you're looking at a Sam Gilliam abstract painting, it's up to the viewer to unpack what that identity might be, um, and I would suggest it's there because Sam is an 80 some odd year old guy who grew up in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, and the fact that he's been able to build a meaningful and transformational career making abstract art I think is almost subversive uh, in the context of the America in which he grew up. But I'm interested in removing the arbitrary barriers, but we still are a reflection of who we are and where we live and the times in which we live. And so all of that, we're trying to address all of that. Does that answer the question? It yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank um, you. I have a question for, for you, Fasoon. Um, if someone is working in an institution somewhere outside of Turkey, anywhere in the world, how would they go about getting support to show an artist from Turkey in their institution? And then the second part is like, where do you see the future of Saha going? Because, like, I mean, it's been so long, there's obviously so much more to, to go. You mean how do they sub, uh, apply to Saha? Yeah, uh, there are some very clear criteria, and it's also on the website. And uh, first, usually the artists inform them, uh, or, or they already know, and they uh, send the conceptual frame and who, which artists they are going to invite, and what is the budget they need, and then we ask for the budget breakdown, and we look at it. We all, all, almost always check a few things. For instance, if there is an artist fee, some of those big, even big exhibitions, you would be all surprised, do not put artist fee, and uh, so we insist on that. And uh, it is a smooth operation in just a few weeks of time, but it should be in advance because in the end we take it to our board as well. If th that institution is an institution that we don't know un until that time, then we go to our advisory board. We have an advisory board and so we discuss with them as well. So always, uh, if an institution is already well known and we know the impact, we make the decision. If we don't, we go to our advisory board. The next step, what, what could be next? <laughs> That's a good question. We, uh, as Pamela said, we look at what is needed. And when we started, we knew that this was a big, big gap. So uh, that's why we started. Now we see that there is a something big missing also, which is residency, a proper residency. You know very well, in the past we had a very good residency and the artists of today, all of them nearly, uh, uh, had gone through that residency. So it's time to start another one. We are working on it. I hope in a few months I, I can give 
the news about it. I hope so. Are there more questions people have? This one here. Hi, thank you for that. Um, Pamela, I really appreciated your comments about the um, race being a terrible lens for looking at art. And I've noticed that uh, African-American artists seem to be held to a certain standard of, um, we expect someone like Sam Gilliam to be I addressing identity um, in the work uh, more than maybe other artists. And I wonder if you could talk about um, more about this idea of content being embedded in abstraction and maybe some experience you've had with the work where you really can like feel that content embedded in the work? Well, you know, I actually think the, the statement of true liberation and freedom is for no single group of artists to be held to any single standard. Artists should be absolutely free to make whatever it is they are inspired, compelled, and dream to make. And so I suspect if Sam Gilliam were sitting here, he would say his work has no social content. I suspect if Mark Bradford were sitting here, he would say his work has huge social content. And so I think that we will be at a point of real inclusion, and I, and I really don't love to use that word, and I'll, I can talk a little bit maybe in a minute about why, but let's just use it for the sake of convenience. We will be in a place of real inclusion, freedom, and liberation when all artists are absolutely free to make whatever it is they feel they should make. Um, and so, you know, one reason I love abstraction uh, is because at least the early generations of artists in our co collection who were making abstraction um, were held exactly to that standard. The work was expected to be about something. It was expected to be figurative. Um, and those artists were less valued for having made abstraction. And I love people who do what they're not supposed to be doing. Um, and so that's why I was, I was drawn to that kind of aesthetic to begin with. Uh, but I think we're now just really arriving at a place where it's okay for Sam Gilliam just to be a great colorist and to be a great innovator, having taken, taken the canvas off of the stretcher and, and transformed the art of abstract painting in doing so. We've got time for one last question, if anyone has one. This one there in the middle. Hi, Pamela. Just a quick, you said you wanted, to, you were going to say why you don't lack inclusion. Can you tell me that well, very yeah, quickly? Yeah, I, I, and anyone who can come up with a better word or a set of words, please help me with this. But inclusion to me suggests that one has one's nose pressed against the window sill and that you're trying to force your way into the conversation. And really what we're trying to do, I hope is a little more nuanced than that. We're trying to tell the history really as it was, not as it should have been rewritten. We're not trying to include people who weren't there. Um, we're trying to shine a light on people who were there making a difference who were overlooked for arbitrary reasons. So please find a better word for me. <laughs> and I haven't got one for you yet, but I think it's been a really fascinating conversation and I think What's important is that while we're notionally talking about art at the moment, but also really talking about how a civil society should work and how we live with other people in the world. And I think this is one of the amazing things that you're both doing. And I'd like to thank you both so much for taking time you probably don't have um, to come and talk to us today. <laughs>